afternoon and welcome to Women Sweet on Women, Black Lesbian Film Festival. My name is Mary Ann Adams and I am the founder and executive director of Zami Nobla, National Organization of Black Lesbians on Aging. Deeply rooted in Atlanta with a national reach, Zami Nobla is committed to building a base of power for Black lesbians 40 and older living anywhere in the country. We service we center service advocacy and community engaged research. We are absolutely thrilled to host our first virtual film festival with Alwyn Film and Sisters in Cinema. Hopefully by now you have viewed most of our films and certainly the one that is featuring Shamika Holzclaw. It is my honor today to be here with this talk back uh, and, and we are Thrilled to have Shamiqua here with her conversation partner, Melissa Gordon. They're going to be discussing Mind Game, The Unquiet Journey of Shamiqua Holzclaw. Uh, just a little bit about the both of them before we get started. Uh, I don't know if there are many basketball fans or just people generally who don't know who Shamiqua Holzclaw is. Uh, certainly as an avid, best, avid basketball fan, I've been following her career for most of my life. Uh, she went to the University of Tennessee from 95 to 99, where she played certainly under Coach Pat Summit uh, and helped lead the Lady Vols to the women's NCAA first ever three consecutive women's basketball championships. She's a former WNBA player, uh, and she was inducted in the WNBA Hall of Fame in 2018. Uh, she wrote her autobiography at probably eight, 18 or 19. Just kidding. She wrote, <laughs> she wrote her autobiography, <laughs> Breaking Through, Beating the Odds, Shot After Shot in 2012. And uh, in that book, she talked about dealing with depression uh, during her professional basketball career. And uh, subsequent to that, she collaborated with the documentary filmmaker, Rick, Rick Goldsmith, and they produced a film on her life. And we're going to be discussing that here today. Her conversation partner is Melissa Gordon, who is a poet, a writer, a community activist, a social worker, and a therapist. Um, Melissa has a passion for, for, for promoting wellness. She's worked in various settings, including populations in crisis, including jails, prisons, psych centers, and more. She currently works in education, where she promotes SEL, S-E-L, social emotional intelligence in students and teachers. She also helps clients meet self-determined goals and develop coping skills in her private practice, new NEW Nashville Emotional Wellness. I am absolutely thrilled to have you all here today for this talk back. Melissa, take it away. All right, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, first, uh, gratitude for being in this space with you, Shamika. And uh, first, I wanna start with talking about vulnerability. And by vulnerability, I'm defining that, taking on my friend Brene Brown's definition, vulnerability being the uncertainty, the risk and emotional exposure that happens when we feel that we have this unstable feeling and it brings us out of our comfort zone. So talk to mm -hmm. me about how you came to be a person who not only became comfortable being vulnerable, but is someone in your, when you think about your platform, you're mm -hmm. always in a vulnerable space. So talk to me about how you develop your vulnerability skills. Um, as far as my vulnerability skills, I think they just developed, uh, it developed over time. Um, I think, first of all, you know, growing up in New York City, um, in the inner city, and my family just really stressing education and putting pushing forth, you know, I think that a lot of it was like, okay, you don't cry about things, you don't complain, complain about things, you just put your head down and do the work. So at a young age, I became a stuffer with my feelings and my emotions. Um, when I went to go live with my grandmother, um, witnessing her have blind faith and take on me and my brother when my parents were struggling with their addiction, I was the kid that just, you know, wanted to make good grades, didn't want to get in any trouble. So a lot of stuff I just held to myself. 
Um, and as I started getting involved in sports, um, I learned that, well, I experienced it healing me. Um, I experienced it like becoming a coping mechanism for me, but still it was a lot of things um, that I was trying to process and I was going through um, emotionally. And I think that's just a tale of my story, you know, um, leaving New York City, going to school in Tennessee, experiencing such high levels of success um, and being a, a top athlete is like, hey, I got to put this face on. I got to show up. I got to show out. And I can't talk about the things that I'm really struggling about because it's a fear, especially in our community, uh, you know, being black, it's a fear of being judged because the emotions are something that are really tough and, and, and makes, un pe makes people uncomfortable to talk about. And finally, I got to the point when here I was, you know, a successful athlete, the things that I wanted in my life, I worked really hard for it. I was able to attain them, but still, you know, I'm a wreck. Let's be honest. You know, um, I'm struggling um, with mental illness. I'm going to therapies. I'm doing, doing, I'm going to therapy, seeing my counselors, doing just enough, um, off and on medication. And I finally, I was just tired of it. It was a, I was in a battle Well, here, like either I'm honest and truthful with myself, or I'm not going to be here um, on this earth. And I just remember I just stepped forth and I said, hey, this is what I'm struggling with. I don't care what people think because it's always a fear of being judged. And that's something that, you know, just stops a lot of people from, you know, living in their truth. And as soon as I spoke my truth, um, I realized like there's a lot of people going through the same thing. It was a lot of people that I could connect with and we're healing together and we're sharing stories and there's such power um, in that. Thank you. Thank you. I know you talked about two things, even in your response mm -hmm. about your path to mental wellness and mm -hmm. talk to us a little bit about how you had to learn to take the courage to take off the mask, to take steps towards your own mental wellness. Man. Oh gosh. Um, I think, Oh man, this is, this has been quite, quite a journey because even now I'm 43 years old and um, you know, I still live with mental health concerns and each day, you know, I'm sort of like in recovery, but I think the steps that I took was realizing that I needed support. I, I think for a long time, I kept things to myself. I got to push through because that's what I learned as a young kid, you know, um, dealing with my environment, you know, you just put your head down, you do the work, just, just clear that path. And same thing with athletics. Like, it's like, okay, I'm not going to talk about these things. I got to show up. I got to show out. And so for me, it was finally saying, you know what? I got to do the work. I got to, I got to do the work just like in school, you know, academically, just like in athletics, if I want to be healthy, I got to put effort into this. So it was really locking in, doing the therapy, doing, doing the work. And it's hard. It's painful when you're dealing with trauma and having to rehash, you know, things from your past and dealing with my parents, you know, or situations that I may endure, you know, as far as like um, race stuff, you know, that was something, you know, leaving New York City and going to the South and having the, all these feelings and emotions that I can never open up about and sitting there talking to one and just like, hey, like, I, I'm angry. I have I have anxieties with certain things. This is who I am. And when I started opening up and just sharing and feeling that 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 um secure and feeling safe it transformed it transformed my life but there's also that point too where um having gone to therapy and realizing that we change over time maybe one the therapy the therapist that i'm seeing is like okay you have anxiety you have clinical depression and then over time realizing all right someone else tells me that i've been seeing for a while tells me oh you have uh, bipolar disorder. And so having to process this ever-changing chemical imbalance is it, really, really, really tough. So I was angry at times because I'm like, all right, why didn't they get it right the first time? Why did I have to go through this? But, you know, when you hear stuff like, hey, it takes 10 years, sometimes longer to diagnose a bipo bipolar disorder, um, having to educate myself and my family, um, that's when I started having a little bit of peace and, and, and comfort. And I was like, all in, I said, boy, like I attack everything else, you know, from, from business to athletics, I'm doing this for myself and to see now, like the color, that's, that's the thing. Like yeah, my life is colorful. Uh, I'm happy, um, for what it's worth. Um, and I just, I just committed to me and that's, and that's such a beautiful thing to, to see the results when you put work in. 
Thank you. Um, what about, you know, I think there's probably not a person in this world who doesn't know your name, right? And know about uh, your drive and all the work that it took to get you in a place to be how successful you were in our mm -hmm. sports. And talk to us a little bit about um, what are some of the pressures to be the best, how to be Excel. So when you talk about that shift from being moving from New York mm -hmm coming down south and this idea of black excellence right and so that's right quite within itself um but talk to us about how maybe that pressure of black excellence and then some other pressures that we don't even know that maybe were were not surfaced in the film affected right. you in in major drive right um okay coming coming from a place like new york and you look at athletics um yeah it's considered like basketball we're the mecca you know um at that time me coming up in new york it's like a lot of bad influences you know you got dealing with the like uh the crack pandemic um just dealing with a lot of street stuff and so your thing is all right your family's constantly telling you make good grades and you're going to make it out of here you're going to you're going to succeed and do well so that's pressure i'm carrying this on my back i don't i don't want to mess up you know they're not telling me to make it in my case because they want something from me they're telling me to make it because they want me to create a generational shift you know my my family was always about education so all my grandma all my grandma's kids went to college and things like that and it's like here i am now she's raising me i'm her granddaughter so the mistakes that she made probably with her own kids she's just really attentive and you know everything that i do she's just like watching over it trying to be protect protect me making sure that i'm doing constructive things and so carrying that constantly and then you're moving into the world of sports you know you're taught all right especially if you're really good like you have to put up this, um, you have to like make sure who you hanging around, having good people around you, you know, watch out because people are going to kind of try to get close to you and you have people, um, you know, trying to get into your network or whatever, because I guess you're popular or you're cool. So having to like navigate that and then performance, I mean, just the average person showing up and doing their job, there's pressure in that. So now you're on a platform where you're getting criticized with your job um, in front of thousands of people and having to have people judge you and, you know, newspapers and stuff write about you and say things. That's a whole, <laughs> that's a whole lot of stuff, man. I, I, it's like right now I'm watching um, the Britney Spears special. I don't know if you guys heard about that and like how, you know, um, Whoopi Goldberg was talking about that and how she, you know, brings that brings up parents, but since she was 15 and, and I'm watching it and I'm like, Oh my God, I can kind of understand that to, to a degree, you know, because you're not equipped. I'm not equipped at that young age to sort of navigate certain spaces, but here I am because I have this talent and ability. Hey, fast forward. You got to You got to step into this. And I just think that um, I wish I would have had a little bit more prepared preparedness, but when you're like an anomaly at that time, you know, no one has took those steps that I've took. So it's not anybody that I can like really learn from in, in a sense, you know, because it's like something that's new. So for me, it was just uh, sort of like this navigating those different things. And then you put me like I had the most amazing time in college, like at Tennessee, but it took some time getting used to because I'm here, like, I, I'm, in, I'm in New York now, and it's just like, I walk outside, it's like all types of people, <laughs> black, white, gay, straight, you know, it, it, it could be cold outside, somebody wants to walk down the street in a bra, nobody's looking, nobody, like, people might look, but no one ain't saying nothing, because it's just like, it's New York, so now here I am, and I didn't understand what I was really getting into, as far as, like, the lack of diversity, you know, I go to Tennessee, um, I'm looking at playing for Coach Pat Summit, they have my major, whoa, this is a winner. I didn't, I went there. I'm like, where are the Asian people? Where are the Hispanic people? Oh, it took a girl from New York was like, obviously you didn't pay attention. Tennessee is 98% the university, 98% Caucasian, 2% other. So having to, you know, navigate that, this change and, um, you know, outside of the campus, race issues and stuff. I'm not saying that's not in New York at that time, but it was, um, a little more in the South, like put in my face, you know, and then you get popular and to see how people treat you different, you know? So it was a, it was a time I really uh, grew up. Uh, it was a time, it was a lot of, um, it was uncomfortable. 
to, to navigate, but I had that safe, that safe space. And that safe space was on that campus. It was with an amazing leader and coach, Pat Summit. And between her and my grandmother, I think those two women like really helped mold me into a strong, um, a strong woman, a resilient woman. So it's, it's a lot, you know, you know how you take the, you go through times and like situations are like bad and, and you just learn like, all right, like I can get through this. And you're young, you're trying to, to fill that out. And when you get those little victories, they, they fulfill you so much. So I think now like the, the challenges that I have with my mental health as an as adult, I wouldn't have been able to get to this place at 43 years old if it wasn't for, you know, my grandmother, June Hostlaw and, 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 and Pat Summit, like helping me understand, like you may hit the ground, like you may fall, but you got to fight and claw yourself you gotta you gotta allow people allow people that you that love you and support you to help you get back up you cannot do it uh by yourself and once I realized that that light bulb went off like oh my god like I have to talk to my friends and I have to talk to my family about these things and educate them if they don't know because some people don't think mental illness is real they like girl you ain't go to church, you know, you need, you need to go, you need to pray, you know, are you tired? In? Like all these different things that I'm hit with. And, and I, and it is like a really tough for me too, because I come from a very spiritual, like my, my family is like very involved in our church at home. And so for me, that's, that was another part that I had to navigate because if I've always had that solid root in my faith, and then like, here I am now, those are the people that are judging me. You know, like, oh, I, I'm great. But now it's like, girl, you know, she going, I heard heard people, oh, she going crazy because, you know, no, oh, she, you know, she date women and all, <laughs> all this stuff. And I'm like, yo, like, this is so hypocritical. So then I didn't want to, to deal in that space anymore. And, and not saying I've never lost my religion or my spirituality, but it's like, yo, this is supposed to be a place of love and, and, and togetherness, you know, like this was the thing that fed my soul for so long. And now it doesn't feel good because I don't feel like supported. So having to like just navigate that and 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 taking my experience, right? And going to like the black church conferences and suicide and telling people like how the church has to take more responsibility, you know, um, in order to, you know, make sure like not being so judgmental, man, you know, just just being a little bit more open. So I'm I'm honored. Like, I'm just so blessed. I wouldn't even say honored, just blessed to see the churn, the, the change as far as like the black church stands on mental um, mental health. It's not just um, relationship counseling center, <laughs> things like that. Like they understand now people are like really going through some severe challenges and are addressing it. I think you're exactly right. You know, I've worked in this field for many years and I think about we still have stigma. There's still a lot of stigma around mental illness and mental wellness. And when you think about the church, it could be such a powerful place for people to get the help they need. And mm -hmm. I mean, many years ago, I worked with the National Alliance of Mental Illness and we had a grant and we actually paid churches to be what we call emotional fitness centers. And so imagine you have someone that's depressed or having on some mental challenges, and then you go and talk to your pastor. Well, it doesn't just stop there with the, what do we say? Just pray about it. I'm going to pray over you. Instead, that pastor has been trained to be a liaison and then they can work. And so uh, mental health providers also have office hours in the church to kind of reduce that stigma. So I say, oh, you know what? This is more than just praying about it. I think you need to go see the counselor down the hall. And so mm -hmm. thinking about that and that partnership, what could we do or what would you suggest society does to reduce the stigma and so that people can get the help that they, that they need, especially thinking about the last 10 months the world has gone through and knowing that, mm -hmm. um, more and more people are probably in need of therapy. So what are your thoughts about what, what could a collaboration look like? Um, I, I would say, you know, you heard that saying, uh, like women lie, men lie, numbers don't. <laughs> and statistics are there. And, and that, you know, with the rising suicide rates, 
um, the people who are stressed, the people who are, are, are going through these challenges who don't have services. And it's just having conversation. Like, that's the thing. We have to, we change by having a conversation. We change by sharing stories um, and having those stories, these, these powerful stories of women and men who are so brave put in the media. It's just so, so important. I, I, people think I, I, I joke around when I say the person, the person. And I ain't never met this person that helped me work through my challenges was Catherine Zeta-Jones. I had never met Catherine Zeta-Jones in my life, but I was like researching about bipolar disorder and it, her name popped up. So I got to see videos and I started reading about her and I'm like, yo, this is a famous actress, you know? And she talks about these things and like, she's getting through it. Like, hey, like, she inspired me to uh, awaken something within myself. And I think that's what we got to do, man. We all got that uncle or somebody in our family who we just write off their behaviors as, oh, uh, you know, he crazy or she crazy. Oh, you know, this is, this is what it is. And we don't, we don't challenge like, yo, is he talking to himself because of something going on, but we can't just always just go on the back burner and be like, oh, uh, yeah, they crazy, whatever. Like, let's, let's like, let's change this generationally. Let's have these tough conversations. Let's say, Hey, let's check in on one another. I mean, I go around sometimes to corporate spaces and talk and I, and I look at the, you know, and I'm, I'm like, ask questions and they're like, yeah, you know, you'll hear something just meeting people sometimes for a couple of hours. You'll hear the, Oh my God, that's my coworker. They're a little high strung, you know, uh, you, you hear their moves and I'm like, yo, like, do you ever ask them like, hey, hey, how's everything going? Um, is everything good? Because in some spaces, people don't communicate. People go and just do their job and head home. And but still, we are judgmental of how that person, oh, my God, a body language. I don't want to deal with him or her. Like, yo, just check in on people. And that little shift, that little say, hey, little little act of kindness. Hey, how, how's everything you good? How's the kids? How's the wife? that can create, sh sh uh, shift the thought, the thought process in their heads. So maybe they're taking that attention off of themselves or helping them get, get back in line. And so I think that's, that's the, that's, that's one of the steps, just kindness, man. We just got to get back to that, just checking in. And we have to understand too, like when we're dealing with our, our family and friends, like touch is a powerful tool. I don't, I, you know, it's like, say, hey, man, come here, give me a hug. I miss you. You know. <laughs> It's, it's like we don't we don't understand that when I see my my cousins and you know I'm like old to them now and I can see that going through stuff and I'm like hey how's everything and I grab them like oh, I'll give you a hug and you can feel how they just sink into you you know and I'm like hey you know whatever you're going through it, it, it's gonna be okay like you can talk to me just just letting people know like at the end of the day I'm here I got your back I'm not judging you like whatever you need to talk about just talk about it. Like I have my stuff. We all have our things. We're we, we going to work through this. Melissa, where did you go? <laughs> she dropped off. Are you back, Melissa? Melissa, you, I mean, the conversation, I mean, it, come on, you just left me, man. I, I was <laughs> yeah, yeah, my bad, my bad. All right. So sorry about that. Good people. They're doing construction <laughs> all over here. It's like, tiny, tiny, skinny house all over Nashville. Um, sorry about that. So I don't know where you want to pick it up. I'm going to go back with that same question. Oh, no, we, we pretty much, uh, I pretty much talked about it. Yeah, all right. Good deal. Good deal. Good deal. Um, <laughs> so next question, thinking about, you know, in, when we talk about trauma, when we talk about mental illness, everyone's so fixed to jump on intergenerational trauma and all these things that are passed down and talk to me about um, I know in the film uh, that was mentioned of your father having mental illness mm -hmm. and um, talk to me about that but also you, you noted so many people in your tribe and so many people who uh, supported you right and so talk mm -hmm. to me about intergenerational strength that could be from your grandmother from other people in your life where you learned about intergenerational strength Okay, I mean, remember that I might I need, might need you to tap back, but yeah, my dad um, having to accept like when I was growing up, my dad I, I didn't really find out until I was in college. I, I did find out in college my dad had schizophrenic disorder, but I grew up with a dad who suffered from severe hallucinations. He would talk to himself and things of, of that sort. Um, I thought my dad was you know, uh, just, a, just an alcoholic, but you know, what I've experienced, what I've gone through and learned and educated myself, my dad was just masking, you know, his illness with, with alcohol because he didn't want to deal 
with the things that were going on um, inside of his head. Um, it's a fear. It's it's the fear that when I was going through stuff, like, oh my God, like my dad got it. I got it. I was scared as heck. <laughs> um, I was scared uh, to address it. It kind of pushed me away from my father. And we're like, we're extremely close, but it, I just was like, oh my God, I couldn't deal with it. I was, I was afraid to, to talk about like um, his journey, but thankfully like in my life, having the support like my grandmother um and rest in peace was like my rock my a couple of my aunts um understanding like hey i love you i'm here for you like talk to me um about things and i always had that but when my grandmother passed um it really took me um to a dark place mentally and so what i did was i isolated you know myself from the love and the support and I'm feeling my head, you know, that crafty little suckers on my shoulder, feeling my, my, my mind with all these negative thoughts, you know, the suicidal um, ideation, um, all those things of me not feeling loved. It was just like, it was, it just really took over and to get to a better place and a healing um, and doing the work and understanding like how important those pieces are. Like you said, that intergenerational support, that family support, um, having to educate them because I had people in my family, like, I don't really understand this, like, but not from a negative place. Like they're human, they live, but they just like, I, I just don't understand because you've always been, they look at it. Oh, you've been happy. You, you're always smiling. You're a great athlete, great person. Like, how could you be sad? And having to really just tell them it doesn't matter sharing stories. Like I'm quick to be like, man, look at this person that's gone through this, look at that person. And so now to see how my family moves different, um, allow my friends, that's, that's the key part. My friends, my sisters and my brothers to know, like to be able to feel comfortable to ask me, yo, like, Hey, are you, have you taken your medication? You seem a little off. Hey, is there um, something going on, you want me to come by and swing by and me saying, you know what, I do feel of, yeah, come by. I think that would be great. Cause the old me before doing the work, I'm not answering the phone. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm in my own world. I, 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 I'm, I'm hiding. I'm, I'm just sitting there feeling myself with these negative, negative thoughts. And so it's just a, it's, it's a growth, man. Support, support is key. But a lot of times, you know, Unfortunately, in the world we live in, people think like I did, like I'm the only one going through this. People don't understand or they may feel that they don't have the support. It's 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 a, it's people. You no, know, I feel like there's there's like suicide hotlines. There's always somebody out there, you know, somebody who has gone through similar things that you know of that you can like reach back to. You are not alone, man, because as soon as I started talking about this, you know, my journey it's like all these people are sharing with me and I'm like, wow, like I'm not different. You know, I'm not weak. Cause I thought I'm, I'm weak and I'm, and, and this is not healthy and all this bad stuff. And I'm like, yo, this is life. You know, life is, you know, ups and downs and all around, but it's great to be able to like talk and, and, and share and to process and work towards a, a better, better day, a better tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that it's important to always have a positive outlook, no matter what we go through. And you mentioned, you know, having some intrusive thoughts. So what have you done to increase your positive self-talk? What have you done in terms of your, your coping skills beyond, you know, some of the medication just to be well and um, to have a strong and positive sense of self? Well, Melissa, it's it's a, a ever evolving journey, but for me, I love just starting my my day off with like some quiet time, um, just just me and my my thoughts, like meditation, um, getting making sure that I have a release, like physically. When I say that, you know, exercise is important to me. Um, I really try to get forty five minutes a day, <laughs> some some activity and. Um, you know, just making sure I'm honest with myself and my feelings, talking about it because uh, with my wife or, or with my friends, because sometimes like in the past, I'm a very internal person and I don't discuss things. And that's when it's like this buildup. So just being able to have um, honest conversation. Um, and yeah, I, I would say 
the fitness aspect, um, meditation, the quiet time is so, so important. And I'm trying to think it's another, another, another thing that I, that I, um, I do, but I'm having a brain freeze right now. <laughs> um, but oh, oh, no, the, the most important thing, I realized a change and I've always been like a regimented as, as an athlete, you know, I stopped playing 10 years ago, but I was always regimented, you know, training, making sure you eat the right things and you are what you eat, you know? And I realized like certain foods that I like, like during, I, I'm feeling sad, you know, I realized, oh man, when I'm down a lot, man, I want to eat, you know, bacon <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and serious, like, there's links that, you know, bacon is, um, it's a feel good food, but I don't know if y'all read that, how bacon is leak, uh, linked to depression. Like, yeah, just like, I'm like, I love some bacon, <laughs> but um, just being mindful, you know, of, of what I'm putting into my body making sure that I'm alive and I'm, a, I'm alert um, and try to be as natural as I can. Because at the end of the day, one of the things I struggled with was having to take the medication daily because um, you know, my family is very much like, you know, uh, natural, you know, like try to try to eat good, you know, take take the herbs of the universe and things like that. And so for someone to tell me, mo mo multiple doctors, like you got to take these pills, these mood stabilize the rest of your life. I'm like, what? <laughs> nah, I'm, I'm fine. You know, I'll, 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 I'll figure this out. And um, just realizing like, OK, this is what it is. I got to do this, but also just trying to maintain um, a balance over my mood. So making sure I, I, I eat proper, proper diet. Um, I have just a couple more questions for you. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned, okay, so I have to be honest with myself. So mm -hmm. tell us about the lie that you have to, you have to stop telling yourself and the truth mm -hmm. that you had to accept. Oh man, you got good questions. Um, the 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 one of uh, the lie. The lie is that yo, I'm okay. <laughs> that becomes that that becomes that became like a still. Uh, I'm gonna be good. I'm good. It's all good. I got this. I got this. Like that. That's a lie. That was a big lie. Um, the truth that I had to accept is that. You know, I have a chemical imbalance and this is something I have to realize, you know, live with the rest of my life. And this is something that I possibly am going to be judged for the rest of my life because of the way society um, is. And I have to be OK with that. So um, I have to be I have to be OK with that. So. You know, I step into the room. It's funny because my, 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 I'm really shy and quiet. So my wife always laughs because she's like. Oh my God. She goes, you just take the energy out of rooms when you walk in, you know, cause it's like, I'm like, I'm six foot two, like, and I smile. Like I love talking to people, but I, I always try to like understand, you know, what, what, it, what, it, what is she saying? And I'm like, listen, when I step into a room, if I'm working in a, uh, you know, athletic or um, mental health space, people know my journey, you know? They, they know what, I, what I've gone through. And some people may judge me. Some people are picking apart my life. So I, you know, it's a certain confidence that I have to have. Like, hey, my stuff's all on the table. <laughs> like, like we're all, we all are dealing with things. It's unfortunately, you know, my, mine is out there. So, you know, just being confident with yourself, you know, like I, that's the thing I had to be. Cause I ain't gonna lie. Like, you know, you play, you play athletics, but some athletics, some of our, people who, as we know in society, whether it's business or education, who pe people who are very successful and reach a certain level of success are very fragile. They hate to be judged. They ha hate to be pointed out. And so that's, that's me. I'm like, man, I used to be like, all right, let me shrink myself down to about 5'11". Uh, I don't want to be seen, but ah, it, it's like, hey, walk in, remember, all right, hey, this is, this is what it is, you know? And I know uh, some of the student athletes that I work with, they're like, man, you're so, you know, these are, these are 18 to 20 year olds. And they're like, oh, you're so confident. You just say what it is. I said, man, every woman, I always tell the girls, every woman gets to a point in her life where she don't give a damn what other people think. <laughs> like, like, I hate to say it, like, you know, are you paying my bills? Are you doing? No, everybody got an opinion, man. And you got to just live your life to the best of your ability and always keep in the back of your mind that you know that you're 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 growing you know what i'm saying you're you're as long as you're being kind to others and you know living 
in a, in a way that you feel good about. And, you know, and so that's at the end of the day, that's what it's about. Definitely, definitely. It's important to be rooted in where you stand, right? So my, my last question is, you know, thank you for making the film and just being vulnerable and taking time to speak with us today. Mm-hmm. So with the film, I think about this idea of legacy. So mm-hmm. in, in sports, you've definitely made your mark, you know, in the Hall of Fame, you have camps, and right now you're doing, using your platform to inform and to advocate for mm-hmm persons that have mental illness. And so tell us what you want people to take away from the film. And when you think about the importance of legacy, what would you say to the world? Wow. Um, whew, and I've thought about this many a times. Uh, from the film, you know, I just want people to just have, when they watch the film, just to understand like being human, you know, and people just going through things and just remembering before we judge others, you know, or, or paint a person a certain way that we really process like what they could possibly be going through. Cause you know, I I used to sit there, you know, New York and California have like a lot of homeless people. And it wasn't until I lived in Atlanta, Georgia, my grandmother used to feed the homeless. So I was always around others, you know, but I was young. And it wasn't until I was in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, I was getting a car wash, and I could see some guys over there, like, they built, like, a tree house. And I'm sitting there, and my homegirl I was with started talking with the guy, and, you know, he's a very attractive man. And he's like, hey, how y'all doing today? And she was like, hey, what's up, man? She's real social. He's like, man, my wife, like, my wife, man, I found out my wife is cheating on me. She, she, she's cheating on me. I got two kids. He goes, man, I've just been living out on the streets for a year. He's like telling us about his former career and all this stuff. And now the first thing you think when most people are like, man, homeless people, they're on, they're on drugs or, you know, they're, they're dealing with alcohol, you know, some type of or some type of crazy story sometimes. But this was a man that was hurt. He was like he was dealing with this pain. Like he, he's like, man, I'm not with my kids anymore. So it led him to a mental spiral, you know. And so, dang, I'm sorry. That story overtook me, Melissa. Take it back. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't forgot what you asked me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, did, I was just thinking about that, not the, oh, legacy. And so um, for me, it was just really, I don't know. I just, I think about my son now, me and my wife, we have a, a 14 month old and I, I just want him to know, like when, when he learns all about me, it's just like, man, like, my mom was, was, a, was a, yeah, she was a talented person and, and, and a kind person, but man, like she was a fighter and I know it wasn't hard for her. And she created this shift within her family. You know, like I've been able to like change the conversation with my cousins. Um, and so hopefully like our family will, will, will change for the positive because we were dealing with sometimes a lot of pain and a lot of stuff that we're endured. And so hopefully, you know, by me speaking that over them, um, that we start to see this and it, it takes that one person. I feel like I've created like a generational shift within my family. Like I'm, I'm the one that walks over and, um, you know, we have, um, in my family, it's very colorful. You know, I have, uh, cousins who are transgender, um, you know, just all types of stuff in, in, in my family. And I hate to say stuff, but all, you know, all just types of, uh, life things that people are, are dealing with, but our family is just like, so rooted around love. Like, you know, and, and community is like, I'm like, you can't call her Noel no more. <laughs> you know, you can't, that's not Noel no more. And my uncle be like, man, we don't care what she want to do. We love her. You know, and I'm just like, okay, I said her, it, it's him now. You know, like our family is just like so awesome. Like in, in that instance, you know, so we we're, I'm, I'm the one that brings those type of things up and we just laugh about it. And my cousin would be like, listen, at the end of the day, y'all my family, y'all knew me from day one. Uh, just don't say it out in public. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's one of those things, man. And um, yeah, I hope that answered it. Um, yes, it did. It did. Um, thank you so much for taking time to speak with me. You've been a great conversation partner. Um, um well, Melissa, I just got to give you, this is Black Girl Magic right here. I'm listening to your resume and, and your the, the impact you're making. So I think that's uh, awesome. Hopefully we'll get to meet each other one day since we know the same, same people. 
My world. Thank you. And thanks mm-hmm. for the shout out as well. I'm just trying to do my part. Right, right. If I could ever be a help with anything, like um, just hit me up. Y'all got my information. And um, thank you for having me. And thank you for screening the film. So, Marianne, I'm going to pass it on to you. Do you want to have some closing remarks about the film festival or anything? I am just so grateful, Shamiqua and Melissa, uh, for this conversation. Um, I certainly learned a lot. Uh, one of the things that we found, Shamiqua, uh, with Zami Nobla, one of the things we do is community engaged research. And the issue that comes up time and again with Black lesbians over 40 is this need for mental health, holistic interventions. Um, and so it's something that we struggle with and we deal with and we're trying to talk about every day and trying to really dismantle all the stigma and shame that a lot of people still feel. So, you know, you telling your story, uh, particularly because so many folks respect you and so many folks in the Black lesbian community look up to you. So thank you for taking the time and having the grace and the generosity to be here with us. Uh, it means a lot. And particularly for black lesbians when they're 50s and 60s and 70s, these are the women that we're dealing with who are still struggling with these issues uh, because they've been closeted for so long. And just mm-hmm. having an opportunity, like you say, to tell the story and to speak out loud and to be in conversation and community with each other is life changing. So right. thank you. And thank you both uh, for, for doing this, for Zami Nobla. Uh, we can't wait to put this conversation in the in the film festival so folks can listen to it at three o'clock in the morning and midnight and at eight a.m. and whenever they need it. So thank you both again. Thank you. Thank you.